says he will open up the windows of heaven yes. and pour us out a blessing yes. that you won't have room enough to receive it. Thank Amen. Let's bow our heads for prayer, Father in heaven. Lord, we want to thank, thank you for your word on today. Lord, we ask that you would continue to reveal yourself to us today in your word. Yes, God. Lord, that you would make it clear that you would take five loaves and two fish and feed the multitude today. 
In Jesus' name, amen. 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 I'm not going to be very long with you today, but I want to go right to our scripture passage, Hebrews chapter 4. If you give me just a little more volume, at least monitors. Hebrews chapter 4. And again, we're going to be moving a little bit in our Bible on today, so keep your Bible handy. And I want to begin with chapter, I'm sorry, chapter 4, verse 11. Still here, a few pages turning. The Word of God reads, Let us therefore be diligent to enter that rest, lest anyone fall according to the same example of disobedience. For the Word of God is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of soul and spirit and joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. And there is no creature hidden from his sight, but all things are naked and open to the eyes of him to whom we must give an account. It's interesting what is happening in the book of Hebrews, just a little bit of a background in terms of the congregation that the writer is speaking to. And here in Hebrews, the writer is speaking directly to a group of Christians who are in danger of giving up their faith in Christ Jesus. There are many who are, because of the persecution and the trial that they are experiencing because of their faith in Christ, because of all of the things that are coming against them, they are wondering if they are able to still hold on. Some of them have come to the place where they're even doubting, they're even doubting the certainty of the second coming of Jesus Christ. They have been hearing about it for so long now. Just imagine this was many, many years ago, and they were getting weary and wondering whether or not Jesus was really getting ready to come. And so they were wondering if they could really hold on, whether or not holding on to Jesus would be enough for them. And so the writer of Hebrews is seeking to address some of their doubt. It's really, he's really wanting them to know that they can hold on to the promises that we find in God's word. I want to read one of the promises that he gives directly to address their doubt in the certainty of the coming of Jesus Christ. I want to go to Hebrews 10, and I want to read starting in verse 35. Hebrews 10, starting in verse 5. 35, I'm sorry. And here's what the word of God says. He says, therefore, do not cast away your confidence, which has a great reward. For you have need of endurance so that after you have done the will of God, you may receive the promise. For yet a little while, and he who is coming will come and will not tarry. Now the just shall live by faith. But if anyone draws back, my soul has no pleasure in him. And so what Paul is saying to the Hebrew Christians and those of us sitting here today who are weighted down by the problems and the cares of life, he says, do not cast away your confidence. And what he is saying is that not only is your reward great, if you would just hang in there and keep your eyes fixed on Jesus, he says you're going to get a great reward. He says what you need to do right now is to have a little more endurance. Oh, you're not with me today? 
Some of us, we want all of the blessings of God. To, we want them to happen right now. We don't want to learn to endure. We don't want to have to deal with any opposition or any calamity or any trial in our lives. And he says that if you endure, that if you're willing to hang in there, in there and have done the will of God, you will receive the promise. For he says that he, yet in a little while... He who is coming will come, and he will not tarry. Oh, you're not with me today. Jesus is coming again. And we can wait with, it, with patient endurance, knowing that we will receive the promise of his coming. But not only that, not only is Jesus promising his blessings in the distant future, but we can experience his blessings, the assurance of his presence. We can even begin to experience his blessings even now while we are waiting, while we are doubting. Oh, you're not with me today. We're going to unpack that a little bit more today. And he says, now he says almost, uh, almost a correction. He says the just, those who belong to God, those who are in right relationship with God, those who have given their hearts to him completely, they live their lives by faith. In other words, they don't live their lives based on their feelings on the inside. They don't live their life based on what they can see and what they cannot see or what's happening around them. They live their life based on the certainty of who Jesus is and the promise that he will be with them. Amen? Amen. And notice what he says at the end of that last verse. He said, but if anyone draws back, my soul has no pleasure in him. Here we see just how important faith is, just how important it is for you and I to hold on to God that without faith, and later in, he says, without faith, it's impossible to please him. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. So you can be doing a whole bunch of things, but it's not birthed out of faith, not birthed out of dependence in God and trust in him, and you will not be able to please him, but he draws back. He has no pleasure in us. When we don't have any faith, because when we don't have any faith, then in other words, it means that we don't really believe in who Jesus is and his power and his ability to keep us. He says you can't please him without any faith. He'll have no pleasure in us. But what was also happening in the book of Hebrews, not only were they getting weary and doubting the second coming of Jesus Christ, but they had also come to the place where they, they, they wanted to rely, they wanted to go back to relying on themselves. Stay with me now. They wanted to go back to how things used to be and how, the, how they were as Jews. They wanted to go back to relying on their own righteousness, the things that they could do to establish their relationship with God. So understand now, here Jesus has come and has delivered them and shown them that they can experience all of the joys of salvation by keeping their faith in him. But now after a little while, when trials come, they start doubting whether or not Jesus' salvation and his power is enough to keep them. So they would rather go back to trying to do things their own way. Oh, y'all not with me today? Hmm? You know, a couple weeks ago, I shared this in prayer meeting. And I shared how, you know, that I was experiencing just a, a period of discouragement. Yes, the pastor gets discouraged in his Christian journey too. And I was feeling discouraged and I was praying to God and, and I just didn't feel like I was connected to him or that things were, were the way that I wanted them to be. And I began, I said, well, let me start doing some things that's going to cause me to feel more connected to God. And so I started listening to, to certain uh, uh, chapters in the Bible, and I, I started finding all kind of things and listening to my favorite Christian station, and God stopped me right in the middle of it and said, he says, you don't have to do any of those things in order to feel like you've been accepted by me. He says, you've already been accepted. You've already come to me. Just believe it. Oh, you're not with me today. 
I want you to understand something, that spiritual disciplines are important. They are the ways in which we cultivate and strengthen our relationship with God. But we are made right with God by faith. Amen. Are y'all with me today? And so they wanted to go back instead of receiving fully the gospel of Jesus Christ. They wanted to go back to relying on the things that they used to do, the things that made them feel connected, the things that made them feel that they were really God's people. It's one of those things, you know, they were big on the feast and the Passover and, and the feast of booths and all of these different things. And they were, they were, they, those things for them were, were indicators, you know, like uh, sometimes our special days that when things are, we have a high day in Zion, we walk away feeling that, okay, I'm, I'm right with God today. And so they, these things had become indicators of their relationship with God. But God is saying, you don't need those things to prove whether or not you belong to me or that I'm I'm with you. You just need to believe. And so many of us, hear me now, hear me now. So many of us, we're trying to make ourselves acceptable to God. We're trying to, to, to prove ourselves to him. We're trying to make ourselves feel better. And we think if we can just come to church enough and, and do everything the church is doing, then it will mean that we are accepted by God. But God is saying, no, you are accepted by faith in Jesus. Jesus is enough. Do we believe that this morning? So I want us to go to Hebrews chapter 3, verse 6. Hebrews chapter 3, verse 6, in addressing this directly, he says, But Christ as a son, I'm sorry, I'm going a little bit fast. Some of y'all turn and I'm waiting for you a second. See, I know where I'm going. <laughs> Amen. Stay with me. Pray for the preacher this morning. <laughs> Hebrews 3, verse 6, But Christ as a son over his own house, whose house we, we are, if we hold fast the confidence and the rejoicing of the hope firm to the end. Amen. Hear me now. He's saying we belong to Christ. And if we continue to Christ, we continue in Christ by holding on to him until the end. It is interesting that Paul is getting ready, getting ready to go to the core of our message today, and they believe it's Paul. No one is certain that Paul wrote a book, but we assume that Paul wrote this book. But it's interesting here in this passage of scripture, in this whole section that, that we find our main scripture text today, is really Paul is really, it is a section of warning. It is a section to reveal to them the danger that they are in as believers because they're doubting God and not continuing in their faith in him. See, what was happening is that they were now, as we said, we're trying to go back to the things of how they used to do it. But many of us like them, what we find ourselves trying to do is that we try to live off of yesterday's blessings with God. Are y'all with me today? Hmm? And so what happened, they begun with Christ, but they never, they never moved past that initial encounter. They never moved past. They never grew up after baptism. Oh, you're not with me today. We got a lot of people in the church that are still infants, the same infants they were at baptism. Baptism is not the end all. That is only the beginning. That's just stage one. And some of us, we got in the pool and we thought that was it. And we're still living, trying to relive how we were before we were baptized or the day we were baptized. Still babes in the faith. But God is saying, no, we must, we must come to a, a new place in him. We must mature in him. And so some of us, we're still living on yesterday's blessing, not understanding what the Bible says, that my mercies, they're new every morning. 
every day you wake up, God is trying to give us some new blessings. He's trying to pour out himself to us even more. He's trying to reveal himself to us, show us exactly who he is. But some of us, we're not ready for what God, the new thing that he's trying to do. We want to stay in the past and hold on to how things used to be when we first believed. And so Paul is saying that this cannot be the case and this is what was happening in the book of Hebrews. They were not trying to move forward and grow in their faith in Jesus Christ. So I'm going to explain exactly how that plays out here in the book of Hebrews. And I want to go to 4 chapter 2, chapter 4 verse 2. And here's what the word of God says. For indeed the gospel was preached to us as well as to them. But the word which they heard did not profit them, not being mixed with faith in those who heard it. So I want us to understand there are two things that are happening. So he's writing to the Hebrews, but he uses an example of the children of Israel's experience when they're getting ready to go into the promised land. And so they have been saved out of Egypt, but they did not hold fast until the end. So they received God's deliverance from the bondage of Pharaoh, but they did not continue. When they got closer to the brinks of the promised land, they stopped believing. And not just believing, but they stopped believing God's word. Hear me now. I want to go to Numbers. I want to read this this for us. Numbers chapter 14. I want to read that for us. In the Old Testament, keep your hand in Hebrews because we're going to go back there. Numbers chapter 14. I want to read the story. I don't want to just tell you the story. I I want you to hear it for yourself. Numbers. Chapter 14. I want to read... Verses 1, 1 to 10. Here's what the word of God says. So all the congregations after the spies now had went and spied out the land. He says, so all the congregation lifted up their voices and cried, and the people wept that night. And all the children of Israel, you know, and they (laughs) they wept because they realized everything was like grasshoppers and giants. Verse 2, and it says, And all the children of Israel complained against Moses and Aaron and the whole congregation and said to them, If only we had died in the land of Egypt, or if only we had died in the wilderness. So in other words, we'd rather stay in Egypt, we'd rather die under Pharaoh, or let us die in the wilderness. He says, verse 3, Why has the Lord brought us to this land to fall by the sword that our wives and children should become victims. Would it not be better for us to return to Egypt? So they said to one another, let us select a leader and return. So let's get rid of Moses, who God sent to us. Let's get rid of him and get somebody else to lead us back. Go back to Egypt. There's some deep stuff going on here. But then it's what happened after that. Verse 5, then Moses and Aaron fell on their faces before all the assembly of the congregation of the children of Israel. But Joshua the son of Nun and Caleb the son of Jephunneh, who were among those who had spied out the land, tore their clothes. And they spoke to all the congregation of the children of Israel, saying, The land we pass through to spy out is an exceedingly good land. If the Lord delights in us, then he will bring us into this land and give it to us. A land which flows with milk and honey. Only do not rebel against the Lord, nor fear the people of the land, for they are our bread. (laughs) Their protection has departed from them, and the Lord is with us. Do not fear them. And here's what the congregation did after that. And all the congregation said said to stone them, with stones. Now the glory of the Lord appeared in the tabernacle of a meeting before all the children of Israel. So they were doubting. Hear me now. They're doubting. Now God told them they were going to get this promised land. 
and they came back with the report and two said, we can take it. But the other 10 said no. And so they got afraid at the report. So even after they start getting mad and say they want to go back, Joshua and Caleb tell them God is going to give us, God is with us. But then they know what they say, stone them. And here we learn a very important lesson in the Christian journey. That yesterday's faith is not enough. Hmm? Are y'all with me today? Yesterday's faith will not be enough to make it into the promised land. But not only that, we see that what happened now, here's the word of God. And and what we see happening is that God's word is not only for the beginning of the journey to awaken faith in us, but his word is also to sanctify us, to make us even more ready, more trusting to, 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 uh, and more ready to meet him. But what was happening, they were rejecting the sanctifying word of God. Are y'all with me today? And so because they were rejecting it because they refused to listen it. The Bible, the, the few to listen, Hebrew says that he, that's where we get the text. Today, if you hear the voice speaking of God, yes, harden not your heart. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Lord, help me. So here we see that the word of God is designed to bring us closer to God. But they had an attitude of rejection to God's word, and they were not willing to trust in his word to do what it was going to do. And that is the same thing that happens to Christians sitting in here today in all of our lives. Just like them, we look at the circumstances and not what God says. And so what happens now, because they reject God's word, God rejects them. Are y'all with me? So God sends his word all along all along the Christian journey to mature us. But at some point, some of us get to the place where the word now is not what we want to hear. Because the word of God was speaking through, they didn't want to hear what God was saying. They no longer wanted to believe God's word. And so some of us, we come to the place where we no longer want to believe and trust in God's God's word. And so I want to go back to Hebrews. I want to go back to Hebrews chapter 4, and I want to read verses 3. I, want, I just quoted it, but I want to read it again, and then I want to go to chapter 4. Hebrews chapter 3, starting in verse 7. It says, Therefore, as the Holy Spirit says, Today, if you will hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion in the day of trial in the wilderness. Where your fathers tested me, tried me, and saw my works for 40 years. Therefore, I was angry with that generation and said, they always go astray in their heart, and they have not known my ways. So I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest. Hardening our hearts against God. It really means unpersuadable. Hmm? So there's some of us, there's some things that we have no problem with in the word of God. There's something that God tells us and we gladly say yes to it. But then God brings something else to our attention. And it goes against everything that we have been taught culturally. It goes against everything that we want to do on the inside. It goes against our desire. And when that happens, you know what many of us do? Instead of submitting to God's word, we reject his word. 
You know, I cannot tell you as a pastor how many people I meet with who are heading on the wrong path. And I open the word and show them, this is individually now, that you're heading in the wrong direction. And nine times, I'll say this, eight times out of ten, they get angry at me. (laughs) But, you know, you know what? These days, I don't take it personal anymore. I'm just doing what God is telling me to do. (laughs) Ah. And they rebel. Because it is not what they want to hear. Hmm? And here God is saying that even if you have put your faith in me and have been baptized, as you're maturing and I confront you with sin in your life, in my word, and you reject it, you will not make it into my rest. You will not receive the inheritance of my eternal kingdom. Mm, That's some deep stuff right there. And the rest here, it's interesting he talks about rest. Now, I'm going to go. We're getting getting ready to the core here. I'm I'm getting here to the turning point. It says in verse 4, it says in chapter 4, I want to read it again, verse 2. For indeed the gospel was preached to us as well as to them, but the word which they heard did not profit them. Mm, Are y'all with me? It did not do what they wanted it to do. And so they did not, not being mixed with faith in those who heard it. So they did not respond in faith. Verse 3, he says, For who have believed do enter the rest, as he said, So I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest. And here is interesting, particularly what Paul is talking about is their, is their process of trying to be holy, the process of trying to be made right with God. And so he uses the word rest to really signify the ceasing of our works. So Paul in Galatians, he says, who, who has bewitched you? Have you begun in faith and now seek to continue in the law, trying to be made right by the law? So he's saying, he's talking about rest. He's saying you have to come to the place you will not. He's saying you have to come to the place where you cease trying to make yourself holy and believe that you are already holy in Jesus. That's right. That you are already right with him. And so he describes, he describes it this way. He talks about in verse 4, he uses the seventh-day Sabbath as an illustration. Verse 4, he says, For he has spoken in a certain way, a certain place of the seventh day in this way, and God rested on the seventh day from all his works, and again in this place they shall not enter my rest. So he uses the seventh-day Sabbath as an illustration so we understand that God rested on the seventh day, signifying that all his works have been, he has completed all of his works. So when Adam and Eve begun their existence with God, their first full day on planet Earth began with resting in what God had already done. He created a perfect home for them, perfect temperature, They had everything, all the food that they needed, but not only did he provide for all of their needs, but he also provided salvation. He'd already provided for their care. And so when we rest now, he's saying that to rest means to stop trusting in ourselves and trusting in God that he has already finished and that he has already performed the work. And so verse 11, he says, he, verse 11, he says, let us therefore be diligent to enter that rest, lest anyone fall according to the same example of disobedience. The word therefore labor, uh, diligent means, it's really a word, a play on words. He's really saying, he's saying believing. He's saying, let, let us therefore be diligent about believing. <laughs> oh, y'all not with me. So it's not an effort to try to do something. He says, let us be diligent in believing, in trusting what God has done for us. 
And then he goes on to say in verse 12, and he shows what, what role the word of God plays. He shows us the role that God's word plays in our lives. Notice what he says. For the word of God is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of soul and spirit and joints and marrow and is a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. Hear me now. The children of Israel had no excuse because they heard the word. And so he's saying to us today that in the day of judgment, when God comes, we will be without excuse because God would have made his will known to us through the preaching and the teaching of his holy word. Amen. And notice what he says. He said the word of God is living. In other words, it has, it's alive, that, that, it, that, that, it, that it is powerful, and that is able to, to create life and transform the life of the person. But notice what it also says. He says it's sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of soul and spirit. And here's the point. He says the word of God now, the reason why we will have no excuse is because the word of God goes right to the heart of a person. So you can sit here and appear to be responding to the word or appear not to be responding to the word. But God knows what's happening on the inside. We can't tell, but God knows. And when the word comes to us, we know. Oh, y'all not with me today. Hmm? Oh, you're not with me today. Let me try to say it another way. It says it pierces. It's a two-edged sword. It goes to the division of soul and spirit. In other words, it shows us what's of the soul, what is of ourselves, and what is of God. So every time we hear the word, every time we study the word, every time we're confronted with the word, we are able to decide, we're able to tell whether or not this is from God or whether or not this is from ourselves. And the word of God makes it crystal clear what is light and what is dark right in front of our eyes. In the deepest part of us, we know the truth because God has revealed it to us. And so we will be without no excuse. He says, going to the division of joints and marrow. And he's just talking about there, just going to the parts that are connected. It separates what is connected. But then it says that there's a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. In other words, it knows what you are thinking and what your motivations. The word of God judges our motives. See, we may be able to fool each other with our motives, but the word of God is able to detect exactly why we do the things that we do. It's a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. Then finally, I want to read verse 13, and it says, And there is no creature hidden from his sight, but all things are naked and open to the eyes of him who must give an account. So hear me now. The same word that preaches the gospel to us is the same word that will be used as evidence against us. Are y'all with me? See, the word of God, the same word now that we rejected, God is going to bring it up in the day of judgment. The same word that we respond in faith and give our hearts to him, and the same word now on the other side is going to be used against us. And so he's saying, nothing is hidden. Everything is open before the eyes of God. And here it has the sacrificial imagery of a priest taking a sharp knife and taking a sacrifice on the altar and splitting it open all the way exposing the most hidden parts of the animal, its kidneys and its liver. So when God's word comes, it opens us up. And it opens the deepest part of us. 
that cannot be hidden. And there he speaks to us. Nothing will be hidden from his sight. And so what the writer here is showing us is that when we hear the word of God, do not harden your heart. Amen. You know, it's interesting, you know, this whole idea that we will know that we'll be convicted. You know, I shared this not too long ago at a prayer meeting. I shared a story of a crank caller who was, they were, you know, decided they were going to crank call some individuals in a phone book one day. And so they called all these individuals, they called them on the phone, and they said, just random folk, they called them, and when they pick up the phone, he says, I know what you did. Please leave town today before we tell everybody. And they hung up the phone. They called five people on the phone and did the same thing and hung up. They didn't know them. They didn't know anything about them. But they said that at the end of the day, four of the five people packed their bags and they got up out of there. (laughs) What they had done was so bad, they had been able to hide it from, they thought they hid it from somebody, but they didn't know that they were exposed, that they couldn't cover the truth, the guilt that was in their hearts. So when they got the phone call, they thought they were exposed. So we can be living a life that's perfect, and everybody will think that everything's okay, but God is in heaven. He can see exactly. He knows who we are, what we're doing. What we have done. But God doesn't just come to judge us. He brings his word so that we can respond and receive his salvation. That's what God wants to do. When he comes to us with the word, when he confronts us, it's so that we can receive all that he has for us. He wants to deliver us. But all we have to do is just hold on. Hold on. Hold on. I'm going to read one more passage, and I'm going to close. One more passage. Romans, I mean, Hebrews chapter 10. <laughs> Hebrews chapter 10, verse 21. You see, I'm still quoting Romans. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 21. And it says, And having a high priest over the house of God, Let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works. I want to go to verse 26. For if we sin willfully after we have received the knowledge of the truth, talking about unbelief here, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins. Verse 27. But a certain fearful expectation of judgment and fiery indignation which will devour the adversaries. Anyone who has rejected Moses' law dies without mercy on the testimony of two or three witnesses. Of how much worse punishment do you suppose will be the thought thought worthy who has trampled the Son of God underfoot, counted the blood of the covenant by which he was sanctified a common thing and insulted the Spirit of grace? Verse 28, he says, If they rejected Moses' word, and they didn't inherit the promised land. What happens now when we reject Christ's words? Hmm? What happens when we let go of him? So my brothers and sisters, the word of God comes to us and it often confronts us but it's for the sake of maturing us in Christ. So let's choose to not give up, not doubt, not waver, but to hold on to him with all of our might. You know, a couple weeks ago, I read a story, happened, a true story happened here in Chicago. Some of you may have read it, 
about a father. He was a, he's a retired Navy SEAL. And him and his son, because, you know, we had a, some really nice days a couple weeks ago. We thought that winter was finally over. And so they got out there on their rafts, and they went to this lake, and they were paddling in the lake. But while they were out there, somehow the father's paddle boat turned over in the water. And he could not get in. And so he tried to get in his son's boat. But the, the boat couldn't hold both of them. The boat was starting to sink. So he, he got out of the boat. But now the water, the water is like sub-zero temperatures. It's warm outside, but the water is freezing. And they're now hundreds of yards away from the shore. And so he knows now, he's telling the story, the father says, he says he knows now that he has to do everything that he can. He, has, he starts relying on all of his, his military training, and he says he knows now that he doesn't have a lot of time before hypothermia sets in and he dies. So he calls out to his son, he says, look, you listen to everything I say. He says, start pedaling to the shore, and I'm going to hold on and swim simultaneously. So his son starts starts paddling to the shore, and he's holding on, and it seems like it's taking forever, and they, it's, they're taking a long time to get there, and he said he could feel his body going into shock. He said he could no longer, he was having a hard time holding on. He couldn't even feel his hands anymore. He was holding on. His hand kept slipping off, and then he had to put it back on and hold on with all of his might. So all the while, his son was crying out to his father, hold on, daddy, just hold on. And he said they were coming close to the shore, and in a distance, two men saw them trying to get to shore. And they jumped in the water, swam to grab them, and grabbed both of them, and brought the man to shore. And here's the interesting part about the story, is that when the ambulance came, the men brought him to shore, and they disappeared. This is a true story, Chicago Tribune. <laughs> didn't know their name. They didn't stay around to see what the paramedics were going to do. They just left. So my brothers and sisters, the point is this. No matter how dark your night is, just hold on. Hold on to Jesus. And when you hold on to him, he sends reinforcements. He comes and he comes alongside of us and he gives us exactly the strength we need. He carries us to shore. So my brothers and sisters today, I just want to tell you today, simple message. Hold on to Jesus. Hold on to his word. Don't let go, no matter what. Just hold on. So I want to make a simple appeal. Simple appeal today. You want to give your heart to Jesus. Maybe you're doubting. Maybe there's an illness in your life and you're doubting God's ability to keep you. Maybe you're doubting that your marriage can be healed. Maybe you're doubting that your children will come back to God. Maybe you're doubting that you can live a life pleasing and acceptable to him. Maybe, maybe you just need Jesus to come in and you have so many questions you don't know what it is. But the God knows. So maybe today you want to give your heart to him for the first time. Maybe it's for the first time. For the first time you want to give your heart to him. I want to give you an opportunity, whoever you are, wherever you are, wherever you're sitting, to slip out of your seats and come and receive Jesus into your life today. He's coming again. He's able to keep you. He will rescue you. How are you here today? Grab a hold Don't let go Hold on
for he's the one he will show you he is still in control here today want to come back to God Draw me nearer. you want to come back to him maybe you wandered away from him maybe there's some things in your life that God is speaking to you about that you have not surrendered to him that you need to confess to him if this is you today I want to invite you to Stand where you are. This is you. Come back to God and rededicate your life to Him. Stand where you are. It's the bottom of your seats and come down. If this is you today. Every head is bowed. Every eye is closed. Father in heaven, Lord, we thank you for your word today. Lord, your word is powerful, it's active, it's able to go to the very deepest part of us. And so, Lord, I pray that whatever it is that you have revealed to us, that we would respond in faith, that we would not reject your work of sanctification in our lives. May we submit ourselves to your word today. May we allow ourselves to be open to you completely. And trust that your word, that who you are, is enough. Lord, may we not harden our heart against you today. But may we respond in complete and total surrender. May we not cast away our confidence. But may we hold on to you, trusting, O God, that you will come, that you will not tarry, and that you will take us home with you. Lord, I pray that you bless everyone here today. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. God bless you. God bless you.